God, we ask now that as we come to your word, that anything else that's on our mind, whatever trouble, whatever is on our mind, Lord, you would let it fade away, that we might hear from you. But we're inviting you into this moment that your word will come alive in us and change us. We thank you for giving us this. We pray your Holy Spirit would now rain down upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the fall of 1972, I was a freshman at Covington College of Oak Mountain, right outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Covington is a private Christian college that's affiliated with the Presbyterian Church in America. And the model of the school is that all things Christ are preeminent. And it shows up in their classes. Part of the strength of the college is that it, it seeks to equip every student with the world a worldview that has been thought for by John Calvin. That all things are to be in subjection and submission to the Lord. The worship of Jesus Christ, but no matter what it is, what is art, music, politics, business, literature, recreation, and of course, the body of Christ. Every professor talked with this in mind, even the English professor. He gave us an assignment to write a paper on any Christian movement or on any religious movement that is an antithesis to Christianity. Two of us chose to do a paper on Satanism in America. Rumor was that there was a witch's couple on Lookout Mountain, and that every every Halloween they would sacrifice animals. We had found a place where we thought it was. There was an altar there. There was a pit where fire had been, honestly. We were pretty excited about that. Because we were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> From time to time, Covenant had invited well known people to come and speak, like Francis Schaefer came and spoke. And People like that. But one of the guys, I don't remember who it was, that said when he got out of the car, he looked up at the main building and said, I see the demons of hell scaling the walls of this college. We need to pray. Apparently, the car crawled out the main building, which the concern for me is that's the building that I live in. But I was fascinated with such an idea. And so when it came time to write the paper, my friend Al and I, we just immersed ourselves in writing about this Satanism in America. We, we were in the library, we were writing, we were thinking, and we both noticed that first week we couldn't sleep. And we were depressed. We felt kind of lethargic. It dawned on us that we were being affected by, by the things we were studying. And so we stopped and began to pray together in Jesus' name against the demonic forces that were apparently all around us. Years later, as I thought about this time, I knew there was at least two things going on that with Al and I that we didn't, we didn't we're too even turn our faith to realize. Number one, we're both very young Christians. We thought ourselves more mature than we really were. We knew very little about spiritual warfare. And at first we sought to enter the enemy camp, arrogance. And secondly, neither one of us knew about the need to be covered in prayer. Acts before we ever attempted to study such a topic, we should have been, we felt the Lord was calling us to, we should have had ourselves covered in prayer before we ever attempted to study the enemy and his practice. God's very merciful. He, didn't know, he did not allow us to continue on this path for long. It did not never occur to us that we should go back and see the ways of the enemy through the lens of the Word of God, and even then, as seasons of prayer and worship. For the past three weeks, we have looked at the Apostles' teaching, Apostle Paul's teaching in Philippians 3 and 4, what it means to follow Jesus Christ no matter the circumstances. What Paul discovered was that his relationship with God through Christ was worth living and dying for. And so today we will continue the series, Restore Us Again, O God, Part 4. We studied the progression of the Apostle Paul's walk in Christ, his first encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, where he was going to arrest Christians there and put them in prison. The encounter completely changed everything about Paul's life. It changed who he was, and God even renamed him from Saul to Paul. 
The Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit and placed him within him the upward call of heaven that he might teach and preach, that he might start churches, he would raise up believers to grow to the glory of God. He'd come to understand that even though he would lose everything that had once been important to him, he had no regrets. He would consider all those things that he lost as rubbish in comparison to what he gained in Christ. The Lord allowed Paul to experience the power of the Holy Spirit moving in and through him. It was the same power, the same spirit that had anointed Jesus to be a man here on earth and to accomplish all that the Father had given him to do. Paul was gifted with the same power, and he would need it for much of the same reasons that Jesus did, because God was calling him into times of suffering, great suffering, for the cause of Christ. And he wanted the church of Philippi to understand that suffering for Christ was not only to be expected, it was his greatest honor. I share with you that I believe Paul's motivation was found in Philippians 3.12. Where it says, not that I have already attained to this, or I am perfectly or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The second Luke we saw that Paul wanted his readers to see Jesus for who he was and is, and to allow the Holy Spirit to open up their hearts, their minds, their eyes, and all their all their senses, that they might understand him and see him as the Lord of their lives. And to know the absolute joy of knowing Christ, even the persecution. Knowing Jesus personally and, and being made one with him, it had given him a reason and a purpose for living. He no longer looked back to who he once was, because he now belonged to Jesus. That's what he focused on. He had seen the hope of the future, and it was the single reality for him that marked the present. Christ Jesus was his Lord in everything, in the present, and drawn to the future, in which Christ is finally and fully known, and he can hardly wait. I can't either. Paul encouraged the church to follow his example and the example of others who surrendered all to the Lord. In Philippians 3, 17 to 19, he gave a, an exhortation and a warning. I'll remind you of that. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction, their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. We talk about how this was such a timely word for us today. As we find ourselves surrounded by events in our country and our world that were brought about by turning away from the authority of God's Word, neglecting to keep focus on Jesus Christ and the examples of those who are following Him faithfully. Paul saw his greatest motivation in keeping, uh, keeping on keeping on because Jesus was making it his own. He also secured his place in the eternal kingdom of God. So he had a goal in mind that was worth fighting for. It was worth dying for. Like Jesus' body, Paul's body was starved. He'd been beaten. He'd been abandoned. He'd been tortured. He'd been tied without food and water. But he wrote in Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Our citizenship is in heaven. In front of we will wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Paul's joy was the acknowledgement that in all things God was in control. And his joy was not faint, it was a real joy in the Lord. Paul was teaching the church that their rejoicing in joy would be seen by those without Christ. They would look at their character. They would look and consider the circumstances that they were in and marvel. Why would they be rejoicing? What in the world was there to rejoice about? We saw last week that Paul was urging Christians who were reading this letter to keep in mind that those in the world were not only watching, but they might be threatened by that. He said in Philippians 4, 4 to 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we reflect on the peace and the joy of the Lord, it affects all of those around us. Praise brings a sense of God's presence, the realization that God is near. And His Word assures us that He always is. Although circumstances and attacks we get from the enemy sometimes make us forget that. And Paul's saying, don't forget that. Focus on, on who Jesus is and what He's done for you. That way, this sense of anxiety and fear should melt away and calmness take over. I told you before that I don't like closed in spaces. I could, I've never been, I could never be an astronaut. Because I could not stand being in that space capsule. All, all tight in like that. It would drive me crazy. And because of that, I don't like MRI machines. I haven't found one yet that was designed for someone my size. A few years ago, I needed to have an MRI. Then they kill one, and their machine is definitely not built for someone my size. I walked into the room, and the technician looked at me, and she looked at the machine, and says, I'm not sure you're going to fit in that. And I concurred. I said, I don't think I am either, but she wanted me to try. And so she stuffed me all the way in that torture chamber. The thing is, if they can see you, they can see your facial expression. They know what's going on. And she could see that I was about to panic. And she was right. And she said, are you all right? I said, I'll be fine. And I'm thinking, you will. <laughs> but what I started doing, I started calling out to Jesus, asking for grace and peace to get me through this moment. I started praying, silently praising and worshiping him. And soon the panic just eased away. And I was just able to stay calm and still for the entire 30 minutes. They said it was 30, but I think it was three hours. Yeah. <laughs> she brought me back out of uh, the machine. She commented on the change in me that she, she had observed. She said, I thought you were going to panic. But I saw it, I saw it in your face, and then you just calmed down. How did you do that? I told her I cried out to Jesus. Who's my Savior and my Lord? He brought me peace. She frowned and she said, Wow. She saw the old man submit to the power of the living Savior. That it made me a new man. It's the practical example of how Jesus goes with us wherever we go. It's in everyday moments. We take the time to focus on the presence of God. It's the prelude to a time of prayer and of supplication that has depth, as life giving. I found that when I, when I do that, I pray with greater faith because one of the promises of God's Word is that the Holy Spirit's presence allows me to pray according to the will of the Father. And it all works together to bring me joy and peace in any and every circumstance. And Paul was hoping that the church would fill up and those who would later read this letter would intentionally, every day, move away from the anxiety and stress and the pressure of their circumstances. And spend time rejoicing in the Lord and praising Him. And Jesus, in His humanity, He knew anxiety. He knew fear. He knew everything, every emotion that you and I know. Which I suspect is one of the reasons why He often went away to pray to the Father and to spend time with him, to hear the assurance of the Father, I love you. I love what you're doing. I love your obedience. Press on. And that's where he found peace and communication with the Father. Our focus cannot be on all that's going on around us, but on the God who's still in control who would not have us give in to anxiety and stress. Instead of focusing on all the godlessness, the hatred, the perversions, and the hopelessness being presented to us daily by a persistent media and those who have Christians crumble and roll up in a ball and hide. Paul instead calls us to be intentional, intentional about our focus. Let's read Philippians 4, 8-9. 
Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Some would tell you that this response is unrealistic. It's merely living in denial of truth, kind of like an ostrich sticking his neck in the sand, his head in the sand. And you can't see it, it's not there. But nothing can be thrown from the truth. Paul is calling his readers to a life of obedience and a right response to the peace of God. The virtues mentioned here, they're not exhaustive, but they are representative of what our focus should be on. The focus of thoughts here are not the desired end of things, but preparation for the purposeful action that God would have us perform. If you're going to, to need to confront a serious matter, being anxious does not prepare you to do so. Not in peace and godliness. And Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul knew that one of the most common attacks of Satan is to use false wisdom as sophistication, as arguments to attack the believer. Let me give you an example of that. This, this plays out in Christian circles quite right? Right now, 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, it's not from the Father, but from the world. I've heard this verse used as a reason why we should somehow pull out of the world and have our holy huddles. But that's not the way of the cross. That's not the way of Jesus. And they say, well, yeah, we'll be corrupted by the unbelieving world. But the point is, be full of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to go and relieve them of their corruption through the Word of God and through the testimony that God has in your life. The Greek word here of use for world is cosmos. And it refers to the inhabited earth. Several verses in John, like John 12, 31 and 16, 11, Teach us that Satan is the ruler of the cosmos, the ruler of the world. But Christ came to set us free from the bondage of sin, so that those who are living under that might be free themselves. So in a sense, we have, who have come to save in faith in Jesus Christ are no longer bound by these things, and we're free to love and serve the Lord. We live in a world that is no longer constrained by the demands of God, by the gods of this world. They don't have to be, not if they know Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer, John 17. He said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. But sanctify them with the truth, for your word is truth. Jesus came and he interacted quite well with those upon the earth, those who hated him, as well as those who came to love him. So how do we live in this world and have an effective witness to those around us? We go back to Paul's exhortation in Philippians 4, 8 and 9, to intentionally think about those things that are true, that are honorable, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, that are commendable, and worthy of praise. One of the ways we do that is by intentionally not focusing on lies, things that are dishonorable, not dishonorable, unjust, or filthy, or worthy of God's judgment. We speak against those things in Jesus' name. When Jesus was in the wilderness praying and fasting for 40 days and nights, Satan waited until he was very weak and hungry, and he came to him and he tempted him. He used arguments from Scripture that sounded reasonable and wise, but Jesus knew the deceit of the enemy. And Paul did too. And he knew the opponents of the gospel had made inroads into the early church in Philippi, causing them to doubt the completeness of Paul's gospel. 
There were still things they had to do, they were told, like circumcision. Paul says, no, that's not true. Because Paul knew where that came from. He wanted the young believers to focus on whatever things were probable food for their spirit. Food for their mind and their soul. He brought about by the peace of God. I love the passage this morning we read in Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind will stay on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. To fixate on all the ungodliness of this world does not prepare us to speak peace and the truth of God's word because it brings us anxiety and frustration and hopelessness. Our focus must be on the goodness and mercy of God, not on the wiles of Satan. Today, pornography has a stronghold of many men and women around the world. And according to psychological researchers, it changes the neural path, the pathways of the mind, it changes the thinking, it changes the, the ability to process the brain. That's how they think of it. Marriages have ended. I know guys lost their jobs because of it. It's insidious, it's perverted, it's blight upon the world. If you're not thinking about other, if you're not thinking about Jesus Christ, if you're not focusing on who He is, those things can happen. Studies have shown that focusing on violent video games changes the minds of children and they become violent and want to act out what they've seen. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, You are what you think all day long. Anxiety and fear can cripple a person emotionally. But Paul knew that the greatest danger was spiritual. Because the mind not set on Christ will find something else to latch on to. St. Augustine wrote, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. This is the battleground for the souls of men and women. And all this has been. This is not new. Paul encourages the church to follow his example in both his teaching and his life. Because his life was, was one of faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. But that's where real peace is to be found, through the God of peace and nowhere else. The final illustrated Ephesians 4, 10 to 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at least you have provided your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am. I know how to be brought low and I know how to bow. In any and in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. One of the most important points of this final section is that Paul's relationship with Jesus Christ was not based on material blessings, the blessings of this world, but on the hope that we found in the resurrection, even when he was hungry. He was thirsty, but he didn't eat. Jesus had pursued him and grew him into a powerful, powerful servant of the Lord. But Jesus, his love was unconditional. It wasn't dependent on what, what Paul had been before. In turn, Paul is revealing to the reader his love. For Jesus was also now unconditional because he was not dependent on anything else around him. It was not dependent upon his circumstances. It was dependent on what Jesus had revealed to him, and what Jesus had moved into through him through the power of the Spirit. Paul had seen the miracles that Jesus performed, performing his ministry. He, he knew what it was to, to weep before the Lord in terrible circumstances and to know that God was there and to live into that. The call of Jesus upon his life was, was not dependent on who was ruling politically whether good or bad, or whether they had the stuff that they needed to live. For the first time in his life, Paul had everything he needed, and it was Jesus. Whatever he was called upon to do, and wherever he was called upon to do it, he knew his strength would come from the Lord's power, and the Lord's sovereign will. In the past few weeks, um, Teresa and I have had to make a conscious, intentional effort to pray 
the praise and to thank the Lord for who he was. But there's all the things that, if you read much on the internet, there's plenty to discourage you. There's plenty to make you think that, hey, we're done. But that's not acknowledging who God is. We thought we were done before. Look at the word of God. When people are dependent upon the Lord, God always came to their rescue. What does that look like? I don't know. But I know if we focus on Jesus Christ and on his mercy, on his love, and we find times of, of prayer and praise every day, we're going to find whatever is coming our way, we are equipped for it because he's also the equipper. And that's the purpose of the church, to rise up, to be the face and hands and feet of Christ, the voice of Christ. In perilous times, it's when, it's when we shine the greatest, or when Jesus shines through us the greatest. And that's our prayer today. That should be our prayer. Lord Jesus, do that in us. No matter what's coming, do that in us. Raise us up. Use us for your glory. This is not just Paul's story. It's been the story of Christians down through the ages who have found a new life in Christ, truly worth living and dying for. Father, we come to you today acknowledging that you are the Lord of creation. You are the Lord of the universe. There's no one like you. There's nothing like you. And there's nothing we can bring to you that you are confounded by. You're not wringing your hands, wishing that you knew what to do. You are the sovereign Lord of all creation. You know exactly what you're doing. Lord, let us put our confidence in that. Especially in those times when we don't know what we're doing. We pray for your mercy. We pray, Lord, that your body would come upon this nation. That you would raise up your people. That we would stand against the things that have caused us to come. We would stand against godlessness. We would stand against perversion. And we would stand against the murder of the world. We ask you, Lord, to move in us, to raise us up. Let us find our joy, our peace, and our comfort there. And no place else.